Today we're going to talk about laws of boundaries, and we're going to look at biblical laws of boundaries. But let me tell you a couple things that you need to know. Uh, um, Christians often get taken advantage of because they don't realize that it's okay to say no. And some of you have lost your yes because you've been taken advantage of, so you're afraid to say yes to anybody, so you're not actually doing what God's called you to do because you either got burned out or you got hurt by somebody. Others of you said yes to people you should have said no to, um, and other times there were times that you probably should have said no that you didn't. So I want to give you permission to say no, and so we're going to practice it, and I will say one, two, three, and then you'll say no. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Yeah. It's a good start. If you didn't say no, then you were saying no to my no, and good for you. So, anyway, but we're glad to have you here. So, you know, today we're going to talk about this idea of boundaries, and here's what I want you to know. There are boundaries in life, and each of these laws of boundaries have benefits. And if you either don't do them or you don't do them the right way, there will be consequences. And so we're going to look at these different things today, talk about boundaries just a little bit. Um, these are in a book called Boundaries, but they really come from Scripture. Um, if you're not in a small group, we're also talking about this in small group, and this is just a little different take on what they're doing. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with kids whose parents were too strict. Um, I grew up with kids whose parents, for lack of a better word, were tyrants. And I had two or three friends th that were this way, and some of you know, how many of you know somebody like that, where and maybe it's somebody you know, Maybe it was your home. Okay, don't, you know, if your parents are here, don't look at them. But anyway, okay. So, so the truth is we all know somebody like that. And here's what I noticed over time. And then I was a youth pastor for years, so I kind of saw this also. Yeah, your mom was a tyrant. Is that what you just said? Okay, anyway, she's sitting behind them. Anyway, so, but here's the thing. So I noticed that these friends of mine especially, but also as a youth pastor, I would, you know, I, you could just see it. These kids were not allowed to say no to anything. They were told to say yes to every adult. And what happened is they would go off to college and one of two things would happen. Number one, most common was the kid would go crazy. They had never been let free. They had always been kind of uh, not, you know, the Bible says raise up a child in the way you should go. It's the idea of giving rails, but they grew up in straight jackets. So one day the parents took the straitjacket off and the kid just went crazy. They didn't know how to take responsibility for themselves and they just went crazy. The other extreme was kids who went to school because they had never had any freedom, they instantly didn't know what to do and went back home. They just they couldn't handle being away. They needed the straitjacket. They were so used to it, to them it was normal. So I say all this to say this. Raise your kids to have good boundaries, to be able to say yes and to be able to say no. Now listen, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be consequences. Your kids should be able to say no to you, and they should have consequences for their no. Let me, let me give you my favorite illustration. My kids, when I take them to eat now, they're in their 20s. Most of my kids are in their 20s. And when we go to a restaurant, they say to me, can we order drinks? It's awesome. So how did they learn that? Well, they learned it very young. They were, they were young, and we'd pull into McDonald's, and I would say, kids, we're getting Happy Meals. And all of a sudden, the kids go, we don't want Happy Meals. And I go, listen, you're getting Happy Meals or nothing. No, no, we want, and they would whine, and I would pull out of the line at McDonald's. And we would go home, and they would have peanut butter and sadness sandwiches. <laughs> But then the next time we showed up at McDonald's and we drove into McDonald's, guess what happened? Father, <laughs> Father, a Happy Meal sounds just fine to me today. If I may have the toy for a boy, that would be wonderful. You know what? I'm even going to get you guys apple pies today. Oh, Father, you have gifted us with the apple pie. How wonderful you are, right? And what was I doing? I was trying to help my kids understand, hey, you're able to say no to me, but there's consequences. There's behavioral consequences. If you're a teacher, you learned that, you know, if you kind of teach kids and you give them rewards and consequences and you balance that, it made you a better teacher. All of us, our favorite teacher was that teacher. They may have even been strict, but they were fair. 
We knew what to expect from them. There wasn't boundaries all over the place. We knew what they wanted. We did what they wanted. And we knew that if inside of those boundaries, we felt safe. And so boundaries also keep you safe as a person. Some of you, because you don't have good boundaries, you are miserable because you say yes to people. And you, as soon as you say yes, you're like, why did I tell them I would do that? So we're going to talk about that today. All right, here's the first, first principle from the Bible. Sowing and reaping. Now, this is a life principle. Here's the problem with this principle. Is that a lot of Christian leaders misuse this in order to get what they want. I'll just be honest with you. And that's not what this is about. This passage is about saying to God, God, I want to do what you want me to do. And, and here's the thing about sowing and reaping. Let me read the verse. In Galatians 6, it says this. Do not be deceived. Basically, pay attention. God cannot be mocked. And then he gives a principle. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And then it says this. This is interesting how this goes with the passage. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. So let me, let me walk through this passage just real quick, okay? A man reaps what he sows. So here's the deal. There are very few farmers anymore in our society. So some of you have, you know, never done this. Maybe you grew roses or, or killed some tomatoes or, you know, whatever, okay? Some of you have brown thumbs, right? Instead of green, you got brown. And you could kill anything. I give you a plant tomorrow and you'd have it dead before the end of the bats. You're the, you're the killer plant. You're the plant, plant killer. Good to know. Don't give you anything. Okay, so so you go ahead and give her the roses already cut. Don't give her a rose bush. Just hang on. Anyway, so, so here's the deal about sowing reaping. Ready? Even in bad times, you have to continue to sow. And so as a Christian, that means, you know, you continue to love people even when you don't feel like it. It means that you continue to say, God, would you give me the fruit of the Spirit for people, love and joy and peace, even when I go through a trial. Because here's what happens. You will become weary in doing good sometimes. You'll be doing what's right, and people won't respond the right way, which, by the way, you're not really doing it for them, remember. But you do something, and you actually get punished for it. You know, you're just trying to be a nice person, and somebody attacks you, and you're like, uh, I was just trying to be nice. Oh. I held a door open for a lady one time, and she got mad at me. I don't know if you've had that happen yet. I can hold my own door. <laughs> anyway, so I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I thought it. I thought it. Okay, so anyway. Fine. Wow. No, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that because I'd get in trouble. Uh, I might take it. So, but here's the deal. Listen, so, so even in hard times, even when you're weary, what do you do? You continue to sow. Why? Because you can't reap a harvest for something you didn't plant. So even when life is difficult, my mom's the greatest example of this, okay? So she has open heart surgery, has bypasses. I don't know what they're doing. I think doctors are standing and doing stuff. I mean, it's just, so she's just had a surgery. She's barely awake. A nurse comes into the room. I'm totally oblivious of the nurse. And my mom says, honey, are you okay? I guess the nurse had been crying, and I'm a guy, so I'm like, what? Right? So... And the lady kind of is upset. And my mom says, come here, honey, let me pray for you. She prays for this nurse. Here I am, I'm just fine. <laughs> and a pastor. No clue. So, so what does that mean? She, even in hard times, she's, she's sewing. You ready for this? If you read in the Bible uh, about Joseph, Joseph's in jail. He sees two dudes who are sad. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in jail, I don't say to another guy in jail, why are you sad? Which is an odd comment to begin with. But number two is, I'm in jail. But Joseph says, why are you guys sad? And it's a butler and banker. And because of that act, because he sowed into their lives, because he interpreted their dreams, eventually Joseph got out of jail. Now, it took a while. The, the planting didn't happen when it was supposed to, but it happened. So even in your hard time, even if you're going through a hard time right now, what are you sowing? into other people's lives, or are you just taking care of yourself and not looking around? You're not being a blessing to anybody else. Let me give you a few sowing and reaping things. Some of you won't like these, okay? If you don't discipline your kids, and discipline is not about straight jackets, it's about boundaries, okay? Straight jackets, that's not discipline. 
All right? But if you don't discipline your kids, they will run wild. They'll run you. You will be tireder in the long term if you're lazy at the beginning. If, if you're late and you just let your kids do whatever they want, yeah, boy, it's easy that moment. But when they're 14, and the other side of that is you can force your kids to do something when they're little, but when they're teenagers, you can't force them anymore. So that's why you need to teach them boundaries so that when they get older, they still have boundaries. So instead of them saying, I'll eat whatever I want when I go to eat with you, they say, Father, <laughs> may we order a soda today? Is this a special day where we can have soda? Right? And so, and so your kids realize that you're the one paying the bill, and so they appreciate that, but you have to teach them that at a very young age and grow them up understanding their boundaries, what matters, what doesn't. <laughs> If, if your kids don't do their homework, there's consequences of not doing your homework. If you don't live within a budget, there are consequences of not living. If you continually do not have money and you have consistent income, then the problem is not your money. I know that's a shocker to so many people, but you know they're like, I get the same amount every month and I spend more than I make and I don't know why I don't have any. Well, and there's a great Saturday Night Live skit about how you don't have to spend, you know, you don't have to buy stuff. And, and so there's a balance in that, of course, and we help people, and we help people financially, and we help people with food. There's all kinds of things. But the truth is, ultimately, you are responsible for what you're sowing and reaping. So you can't blame somebody else for, you know, your car payment. You can't blame that salesperson that talked you into it. Didn't like that, did you? That was too close for some of you, all right? You think that one was painful? Wait till I get to this next one. I don't like this next one. Here it is. If you don't take care of your body, you will have health problems. Great illustration. I was driving. This wasn't my fault. The hot and now sign came on. Krispy Kreme. You do not bring Krispy Kremes to our church because of this sermon. Next week they'll be crispy and I'll have to run. Okay? Especially if they're hot. That's just, anyway, so the hot and now sign came on, which of course drew my car into the drive. It wasn't my fault. I ordered 12. By the time I got back to Kyle, there were six. I didn't even know I had eaten six because, oh yeah, it was good too. <laughs> really good. But let me tell you something. If you eat donuts, you will become a donut. You reap what you sow. I would love it if you could just eat. And every once in a while, there's somebody who eats whatever. I eat whatever I want. And we hate those people, right? You know what I'm talking about? Well, let me tell you something. Even those people, if they don't take care of themselves, will not have good health. Okay? And some of you I know, genetically, you have a harder time than other people. Blah, 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 blah. I understand all that. But we have to be careful that we pay attention and we sow what we want to reap. That comes to relationships, too. If you're always harsh with the people around you, you're going to reap that. You're going to reap people who reject you and push you away. Do you love the people around? Do you care about how do you speak to each other? If you constantly belittle and look for the negative in your spouse, guess what? Over time, they really don't want to talk to you anymore. After a while, they just... Right? So what are, you, what are you sowing? What are you sowing into your marriage? What are you sowing into your home? What are you sowing into your children? What are you sowing into God's kingdom? What are you sowing to make a difference in the world? What are you sowing at your workplace? I mean, honestly, are you really doing your job the best you can? Are, are you, is that what you're sowing? You know, what are you sowing in all these areas of your life? And then what are you reaping? Now, you don't always reap right away what you sow. And sometimes crops die. I understand all that. But if you continually do it and you don't grow tired in doing what's good, like it says here, you'll reap a harvest. So here it is. I am responsible for my actions and consequences. So if you bought a car, you can't blame the salesperson. Can't believe they talked me into that loan. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. You signed the piece of paper. They may have convinced you, but guess what? You could have done whatever you wanted. So just let's own it. Let's own some of these things. Don't say that sign made me buy six, 12 donuts and eat six. Number two, how I'm responsible for and to. I love this verse, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. By the way, chapter 12, awesome. It talks about great people of faith. 
And I love this idea, the idea that people have gone before us, are watching us and cheering for us in the arena. And here we are going through life and they're saying, go, you can do it. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And this idea of hindering is like a backpack. It's like something weighing us down while we're trying to run. It's the idea of looking at the past or carrying anger or carrying unforgiveness or carrying something that just wakes worry. I don't know about you. I, worry makes me tired. I've never had anybody say to me, I had the best night's sleep. I worried all night. It was great. <laughs> right? So what happens? When you start to worry, what happens? You keep yourself up. You freak yourself out. You're exhausted. Hope gives you energy. Hope gives you strength. Worry wears you down, and that's what this talking about. This idea of worry down, and then it says, "And the sin that so easily entangles, and sin easily entangles, doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, you know, asking, you know, running against God." And then it says, "Let us run with perseverance." This word perseverance in the Greek is really cool because it involves the idea of hope. So you can go to sleep with worry, or you can run with hope. When you go to sleep with hope, it, it, you sleep better. When, when you go through your day with hope, even through trials, as you have hope, you can endure. That's what this word means, the idea of enduring hope. And then it says the race marked out for us. It doesn't say the race marked out for somebody else. So you have to look in the mirror. You cannot blame anybody else for your deal. And also, you don't need to go through life going, I wish I was like that, I wish I was like that, I wish I was like that. No, no, you have your own lane. Run in your lane. Quit looking at everybody else's lane. By the way, if you want to run well, running, looking at other people is not good. Bolt can do that, but no one else. He's the only one. I've, I've never, that guy's awesome. And then it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, that means finisher, of our faith. For the joy set before him endured. Listen to that. Listen to that little sentence. You can have joy while enduring. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're enduring right now. Maybe it's me talking. <laughs> I'll put up with him for another. What I got? What's he got? 15? He goes 20? Uh, 30? I'm going to take a nap, right? So endure with joy. Can you endure with joy? It means even when you're going through something rough, you realize the hope that you have, and you can actually have joy. This is what Jesus did. It said, for the joy set before me endured the cross. That's beyond anything we will ever experience. And then it says, he scorned its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then it says, consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured such opposition. You ever feel opposed? From sinners. Why? So you won't grow. Here's the word again. Weary. And lose heart. You ever get tired? What's weighing you down? Are you mad at somebody? Are you distracted by worry? Is your health messing you up? Fix your eyes on Jesus. You have to run your own race. You can't compare your strengths with other people's weaknesses and go, wow, they could be like me. <laughs> and you can't compare your weaknesses to other people's strengths. Oh, I can't. I wish I could be like them. Wah, wah, wah. Debbie Downer. Sorry, Debbie. That's a studying eyes It's not you. It's not you. You need to realize, too, by the way, in life, other people will try to trip you. There are, there are evil people that will. And you know, some of you instantly thought of who I'm talking about. You're like, oh, yeah. That. There are people who will try to trip you. But if you have your eyes the right way, you get up very quickly. And if you have your eyes on that person, you will stay down. So get your eyes off of them. I don't know who it was that tried to trip you. Get your eyes off them. They're not the goal. They're not the goal. So here's two things. I'm responsible for my feelings, actions, and behaviors. By the way, feelings sometimes you can't control. It's not saying you can control your feelings, but you're still responsible for them even if they're wrong. You still have to, you know, you can't punch somebody and go, well, I just were ugly and made me mad. It's, you're responsible for that. I learned that in school. You can't just... And then number two, I'm responsible to others for how I treat them. So no matter, you can't say, well, you made me mad, so I did this. You said this to me, so I said that. 
By the way, if everybody always amps up everything, you can't stop a fight if you just amp it up every time they say something. Somebody has got to be the peacemaker. You're responsible to others for how you treat them. Okay? Number three, power and powerlessness. I don't like this one at all. Because I'd like people to just do what I want them to do. Be nice if I want them to be nice. Right? I want, I want everybody to just... You know, could you people drive the way I want you to quit tailgating me, right? Right? I don't know about you, but I'm like an anti-tailgater. I have issues. This is my issue. So I've been driving in Orlando a lot, and all those people tailgate. And I have a right foot that wants to hit the brakes. It's so hard. It's so hard. It's like, dear Lord Jesus, help me to not drive the way I want to, because all of these people will die today. Because I think it's my job to keep that person. And I just love the idea of tapping the brakes and watching their eyes go, <gasps> right? I just love it. Right? But that's not my job. You can't actually change other people. You may be able to force them to do something for a little while. You may be able to be kind and not, but you know what? You can be kind and nice and loving towards somebody, and they don't have to return that. You can be married to somebody and be kind and nice and loving towards them, and they can be mean and spiteful to you. But you can control how you treat them, and that's what you're responsible for. Power and powerlessness. I love this. Romans 5, 6 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. So I don't have the power to change anyone, including me. If you're in AA, you've already heard this. But I can allow God to change me with his power. And I have seen that year after year. I still remember an 80-something-year-old man. He was so bitter and so angry and so hateful. His family had stolen from him. He had such a hard childhood. He had so many people to be mad at. And God got a hold of him. And I saw this bitter, angry man who used to sit in church like this. Be filled with joy. Begin to go out of his way to care about other people. To begin to take the little bit that he had. So much had been stolen from him. But he took the little bit that he had and went out of his way. And he would, he would quietly do things for people behind the scenes. They never knew who did it. But I was his pastor, so I knew who did it. I knew that God took a bitter old man who was hateful towards people and poured love and joy. And that man began sitting in church. <laughs> That's the face he made, I swear, <laughs> every time. He didn't like to sing, but he didn't sing like this. Why? Because God began to pour love and joy into the guy's life. He'd come to me and go, I love our church. I just love our church. I'm like, well, you didn't win your first game. It was pretty bad. Huh? <laughs> but you know what? I didn't have the power to change him. You don't have the power to change anybody. Quit trying to change them. You know, even your children, give them consequences, but let, let God deal with them. Give them consequences. Give them boundaries and let them, every once in a while, run against the boundaries and see what happens. Let them, let them have the consequences of their behavior. You know, you're not going to do your homework tonight? Okay. Oh, you got an F on your report card? <laughs> we have to disconnect the internet. What? Is this a little house on the prairie? You know what? <laughs> Number four. That was pretty funny. That was good. Uh, is that bad? The pastor just called what he said funny. That was really good. I thought it was pretty good. It's like I'm talking to myself up here. It's really, wow, there's like a squirrel conversation going on. All the squirrels are. So receiving other boundaries. All of us have a friend who doesn't say no. We, we all have a McFly friend. And we're like, could you just have a spine? Just everyone's just... Every once in a while, stand up for you. You know, every once in a while, fight for your rights. Every once in a while. But no, they never did. And probably they grew up in a house that never did. Or a house where they were forced to do everything. So they never really learned good boundaries. Or their parents didn't enforce any boundaries. So they didn't learn anything. And now they just say, oh, okay. And some of you weren't allowed to say no as a kid. So you've never learned a good no. So now what you do is you say no to everything. Because, because when you say yes, you tend to overdo it. You need to learn a good yes and a good no. You want to say yes to the things God wants you to say. And yes, you have to make choices. You know, as a pastor, you know, as a pastor and a person who's a middle child, it's very difficult because people come to me all the time and they say, Eric, I have this great idea. And I'm like, okay, what's your great idea? And they tell me the great idea, and I'm like, wow, you really ought to do that. And they go, no, 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 it's for you to do. 
Huh? If, if I took every idea from every church that somebody gave me, do you realize how tired I would? You would be visiting me. And there would be flowers on my chest and I'd be smiling because I wore myself out. You've got to say no to some things. And it's okay to say no to some things. Listen, God does not force you to do anything. Did you know that? Listen to this verse. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. What? This is God himself. It's talking about Jesus, but it's God himself basically saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to wait for you to open the door. Could God knock the door down? Absolutely. He's got power. He can knock a door down if he wants to, but he doesn't. He waits on you. And he waits on me. This is such a great illustration of who God is. And then it continues. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. And then here's the other place we mix it up. We think, then he's going to come in and yell at me and hit me with something. No, no, no. Listen to what it says. I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. Those of you who love food should love the Bible. <laughs> you know, once in a while people are surprised that we have food in church. They're like, I can't believe that we have food in the sanctuary. Well, first of all, this is not, and the building over there, that's not the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary. And let me just give you a couple of illustrations. Feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 5,000, Lord's Supper. There's a few others. The party at Levi's house. I mean, come on, pay attention. Food's kind of part of the Bible. Man, I can't eat and listen at the same time. Yeah, that would have kind of... I mean, if we really wanted to be biblical, we'd have blankets. It'd be really weird. People would walk in like, uh... That's really cool, Pastor. It's a very 60s reference I did there. Anyway, so here I am. I stand at the door and knock. I don't know about you. I don't like it when other people say no. I would like to force them to say yes. It'd be nice if I could just, just do my will and everything's good. But even God himself does not force us to do anything. And you and I need to recognize that helplessness. God allows me to say no, and I should allow others to say no. And then finally, number five, motivation. This is critical, and you guys need to understand how important this is, because this is why I think most Christians are grumpy. Because they're doing things for the wrong reason. They're doing the right things. They look really spiritual, but they're doing them because they feel like they have to or they feel like they're forced to do it or, oh, I guess I'll help in there because I have to. <laughs> so you have churches on both extremes. You have churches where everybody says no. I know churches that had to go and hire entire staffs to watch their children. If that happens at our church, we will close the doors. You, you know what revival in a church is? It's when the nursery says, I'm sorry, we just don't need any help this week. What? Yeah, yeah, we got too many people helping. We got a couple people standing in the back. We don't even know what to tell them to do. I mean, that's revival. When people are saying yes to the right things. But you have two extremes. You have one where nobody says yes to anything. Well, that's not my spiritual gift. You think Jesus' spiritual gift was washing feet? No. Why did he wash their feet? Because they needed to be washed. But he didn't wash their feet and go, I guess nobody else is going to wash your feet. Right? And so, so we struggle with both. So, we, so our kids don't do their chores and we do them for them and we're angry about it. So we have a choice. We either have to not have the attitude that we have or we put boundaries up. If you find that you're doing something and you're angry while doing it, you're doing it for the wrong reason. So you either need to change your attitude or change the action. Either quit doing that thing or get over it. And I'll be honest with you, most of the time, I just need to get over it. Each of you should give what you've decided to give. This is talking about giving financially, but it applies in every area. Decided what to give in your heart. Listen, not reluctantly. <clears throat> or under compulsion. I just feel so guilty. I just, there you go. Right? So neither way. You're not supposed to give either way. Why? For God loves a cheerful, this is the word for hilarious, giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good, what's the next word? Every good work. It means when you do things for the right reason, what's going to happen? It's going to multiply. And guys, you know why some of you are sad? Because you haven't said yes to the right things. You haven't gone out of your way to be a blessing to somebody and be blessed. And the reason some of you are sad is you said yes to everybody. 
Find out what God wants you to do and do it. When I'm motivated by love, instead of guilt or compulsion, I enjoy the life God has for me. Now, I want to look at, real quickly at Luke chapter 9. We're going to walk through this very quickly. This is some boundaries. I don't know if that's the best word, but these are some things that Jesus talked about. If you followed him, here's some things that are going to happen. Here they are. Number one, if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to have to die to your desires daily. How do I know that? Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their jacuzzi daily... Right? So if somebody told you the Christian life is easy, they haven't read the Bible yet. Take up your cross. That's not good. It's difficult. It's a struggle. It's sometimes hard. Daily and follow me. Who are you following? You're following Christ. Number two, we have to sacrifice our comfort. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but I don't have a bed. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Number three, we have to tell other people about him. Of all weeks, with everything that happened in Las Vegas and things that are happening around the world, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is so huge. We should realize the world really needs Christ. You know, the Bible calls God the God of all comfort. But a week like this, sometimes all people need is comfort. God, give them comfort. So do, I don't even know what to say to them, Lord. Give them comfort. He said to another man in chapter 9, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but you go proclaim the kingdom of God. By the way, most theologians think his dad was still pretty young. He was basically saying, hey, when I have time, I'll do what you want me to do. And so, so many of us have excuses for why we're not being obedient to God, why we're not telling other people about him. I'm busy. I have a... there's, listen, there's always something. There's always some excuse. Number four. And finally, keeping my eyes on him in obedience. Still another said, I'll follow you, but let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This didn't mean that Jesus was saying, never talk to your family again, which is some have said. But it's the idea that when you begin to follow God, you don't constantly look back. Some of you right now are saying, hey, you know, I'd follow God, but you know, I grew up. And you fill in the blank. You know, I would forgive that person, but, you know, and we're just looking over the shoulder. You can't go forward well when you're still looking back. Some of you just need to forgive somebody who hurt you. Some of you need to forgive yourself. Some of you need to get past whatever you thought back there and begin going, God, I want to follow you. There are boundaries in life. Each of them have benefits, and when you don't do them, they have consequences. But I want you to know something. The Bible says that God absolutely loves you. He loves you more than I could ever love you. He loves you more than you could ever love yourself. And the Bible says because he loves you, he sent Jesus to die for you because you're messed up. If you don't know you're messed up, just hang around me. Between you and me, we'll figure out we're messed up. We're sinners, the Bible says. It means we don't get it all right. We don't even think the right things. You're sitting in church. You're already thinking about lunch. The Bible says we all sin, but what happened? But God sent Jesus to die for us. Why? Because we weren't worthy. Because Jesus died for us, the Bible says that if we trust him, if we put our faith in him, John 3, 16, that we can have eternal life. So if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to God, I'd love to talk to you about what that means. Maybe you don't believe any of that, and I'd love to talk to you about what that means. But if you're here today and you're a believer, my prayer is that you will learn to do what God wants you to do and to say no to what God doesn't want you to do, and that you wouldn't just follow your own desires, but you'd say, God, help me to sacrifice for you to do what you want me to do, but also the most important thing, to every day open the door to God and let him come and spend time with him and allow him through this Holy Spirit to change you, to feed you, so that no longer are you full of emptiness and darkness and sadness, but he can fill your heart with joy and encouragement and peace because that's what he does. That's what he does. Not because you're good enough or smart enough, but that's just how good he is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Father, I thank you that you love us. And Father, I thank you that you've given us the right to even say no to you, but Lord, also to open the door to you. And I pray in each of our lives we can open the door to you. Father, we know sometimes in our lives we don't trust you. Sometimes we don't walk with you. But, Father, we want to be obedient to you, and we want to sow into the lives of others. 
We want to do the things you've called us to do. But Father, also help us to say no to the things that are frivolous, to the things that don't matter. And Father, I pray today for anyone here who doesn't know you that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, continue to work on our hearts and in our lives. Change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming here today. We're going to have our time of giving. You give cheerfully today, or don't give. Dave's going to uh, do a song to close our service.